All right, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cecil Chick. Um, I use female pronouns, she, her, and hers. Welcome to the third day of Social Justice Week here on campus. Um, while Social Justice Week has been around, thanks to Dirk and ASI, this year we were able to bring many more of our campus partners to the planning of this event. Um, we're proud to offer over 30 workshops and programs this week to faculty, staff, and students. I also wanna thank you all for joining us for our fifth installment of the Titan Table Talk um, series brought to you by the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Programs in partnership with the Alumni Engagement in Government and External Relations. Today, our panelists will be engaging in a dialogue focused on the power of the female vote. Um, our dialogue today will be moderated by Dr. Natalie Pusakis, um, Professor of History here at Cal State Fullerton. Now, before we get started with the program, I want to provide some Zoom housekeeping information. Um, first and foremost, um, today's uh, dialogue will be hosted in a Zoom webinar setting, so participants of the webinar are muted and will not have the ability to use your mics. We will have a moderator that will lead us through the dialogue with our panelists today. If you do wish to ask any questions or have any follow-up questions for our panelists, please utilize the Q&A function located in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be addressed in the last 20 to 30 minutes of the program. Finally, this dialogue will be recorded today and posted with closed captioning on the DIEP YouTube channel for everyone to enjoy. At the end of this program, please fill out the event feedback form that will be sent to all participants um, you, to the email that they use to register. And if you enjoy today's dialogue, please keep a lookout for the APITA Heritage Month on Titan Table Talk on April 14th. To kick off our event today, I would like to introduce the president of Cal State Fullerton, Fran Virgi, to provide some welcome remarks. Thank you, President Virgi, for joining us today. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. It's great to see you, even though it's on Zoom and uh, we're not in person. That's going to happen soon. Uh, uh, on behalf of the number one university in the CSU for both graduating women and registering voters, welcome to Titan Table Talks, the power of the female vote. They are so interconnected for us. What an outstanding topic and one of, one of just many events uh, on campus centered around uh, both Women's History Month and Social Justice Week and the, and the a confluence of those events as well. As we discuss the theme of the power of the female vote, I wanna recognize who we are. In addition to the number one ranking in women earning bachelor's degrees that I opened with, seven of our nine academic deans are women three of whom are women of color. Two of our new vice presidents who joined our cabinet this past year are both women. More than half our ASI leaders, our student leaders are women. We are the first university, we were the first university on the West Coast to appoint an African-American woman president with Jewel Plummer, Plummer Cobb. And we were the first CSU to appoint a Latina president. I bring these points up, not just to revel in our history, but to underscore a truth that you've heard me say about Cal State Fullerton before. We are Orange County, only sooner. We are California, only sooner. And we are America, only sooner. Which is another way of saying that as the Titan family goes, so goes the rest of the nation. What we are today, Orange County will be in five minutes, California will be in a week, and the nation will be next month. So when you think about the fact that President Jewel Plummer Cobb, the first black woman in our nation to earn a PhD in biology is a Titan. And when you think about the fact that President Mildred Garcia, the first Latinx woman to lead a campus in the nation's largest system of higher education is a Titan. And when you think about our ranking atop the state and atop the nation in conferring degrees to women, and when you think about the hundreds of thousands of Titan women on our campus and around our nation, past, present, and future, who have and continue to chip away at these and other glass ceilings, you know, a, an epiphany begins to form here, at least for me. And it is this, when someone finally does break through with a shattering of that glass ceiling, that it can be heard around the world, someone such as Vice President Kamala Harris just did, 
it's not a stretch to say that at least some of the shards that are left in that wake, at least some of the resulting social justice opportunities that are created can in some ways be traced right back to Cal State Fullerton. So when we see gender pay gaps decreasing and equitable access for women leaders increasing, we can be proud that Cal State Fullerton has been a significant force in that progress. And when we see 126 women in Congress, 25 women in the Senate and 101 women in the House, we can be proud that these diverse women, including the first two Muslim congressmen in history, the first Native American congresswoman in history, and the youngest woman to serve in Congress ever, that they look like our faculty, like our staff, and like our students. They personify the social justice that we claim to uphold, and like all of us, they are America only sooner. As I mentioned at our Titan Table Talk for Black History Month, my colleague and friend, President Parham at uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills, he recently wrote a piece in which he reminded us that when it comes to social justice, no one person tells the whole story. With that in mind, it's important to note that just as Kamala Harris stands on the shoulders of women leaders of the past, like Geraldine Ferraro and Shirley Chisholm, she also is lifted up by women leaders of today, particularly in regards to the power of the female vote. Georgia's Stacey Abrams rightfully became the face of that power of equitable voting. But let's be clear, countless other women, most of us will never hear about, some from right here on our campus, were integral in the voting rights and the advocacy that helped pave the way for Vice President Harris's election. Now, these points of pride certainly don't negate our need to do better any more than they suggest that gender inequities no longer exist on our campus, in our state, or in our nation. And as I wrote in an email to campus just this past Friday, like most institutions across our nation, we have not yet reached our goal to create and uphold a campus climate in which all faculty, all staff, and all students are truly free in all facets of campus life. That is our goal, and we are working toward it. We want them to be free from the sting of marginalization, free from the injustice of unacknowledged privilege and the pain of systemic discrimination and racism. And as the social justice principles document that were attached to my email suggest, we cannot separate, we cannot separate the conversation between racial justice and justice for all marginalized groups when the oppression and liberation are interconnected. Instead, we need to take a step back, examine and discuss the historic parallels of racial injustice and other human rights movements in our country. Women's rights, and as we saw in this last election, the power of the female vote are critical parts of the human rights movement on our campus, in our region, and around the nation. Through our work and advocacy, a day will come when there is no equity gap or salary discrepancy or disenfranchisement when it comes to women voters and leaders. But if we are America only sooner, then we must first catalyze that change right here at Cal State Fullerton. You know, as I've mentioned to some of you before when we've talked informally, through the nonprofit work that my wife Julie and I lead in Rwanda, I have seen firsthand the transformative change that can come when women have equitable access to voting, work, pay, and power. When substantial numbers, numbers of the able-bodied Rwandan men were killed during the genocide in Rwanda, and in our efforts to help rebuild the country, it was impossible not to notice how much of the leadership positions had changed. And we're for the first time in the country's history, history, we're being occupied almost exclusively by women. Women judges, police, attorneys, government leaders, teachers, everything, everywhere. These women who did not have the opportunity at education or training that their male counterparts had had, who had to move forward without their husbands, without their brothers, without their sons, who had just witnessed one of the most horrific massacres in human history. 
These women single-handedly led the country out of despair. And they continue to lead its ascension out of the darkness of genocide. They are the physical manifestation of the power of not just the female vote, but also the female voice and why it should be at every table, everywhere in the world. Like all women, these brave women Rwandans possess the inner strength and natural leadership abilities that the other half of our population can and should and must study, learn from, and follow. So that's what I'm here to do, listen and learn. And that's why I'm going to be quiet now. But first, I want to say thank you to Bobby Porter, Cecil Chick, Courtney Keon, and the entire team in our diversity, inclusion, and equity programs. And I also want to thank our moderator, Dr. Natalie Fasekas. She is amazing. And also our amazing panelists, Titan alumna, Michelle Martinez. Titan alumna, Bratil Agassi. Titan alumna, Lucy Dunn. And Tammy Tran, I know two-time Trojan alumna, but starting today and from this point forward, a Titan for sure. And finally, I wanna thank all of you for being here and being willing to listen and engage in this critical conversation at this critical time in our history. As this amazing panel and all, and all of you uh, uh, listen and engage, we truly are America only sooner. We are making the future of our nation brighter than ever. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. And I'm so excited to hear the panel. Uh, thank you so much, President Virgie, for reminding us how much Cal State Fullerton has empowered women through education and continue our commitment to do, doing this work. And also your words of serving as a call to action for us to continue to have this important dialogue. Now to officially begin, I wanna introduce our moderator. Dr. Natalie Fusekis is the director of the Lawrence B. DeGraff Center for Oral and Public History and professor of history here at Cal State Fullerton. She specializes in modern US history, grassroots politics, women's history, and oral history. Dr. Fusekis has been engaged in oral history work for almost 25 years, conducting dozens of interviews, teaching oral history methodology to undergraduate students, graduate students, and community members. She has coordinated and directed a number of oral history projects, including the El Toro Marine Corps Air Station Oral History Project in collaboration with the Orange County Great Park Corporation, as well as the Women's Politics and Activism Sense Suffrage Project, funded by a major research grant from the John Randolph Haynes and Dora Haynes Foundation. In 2011, she, was also, she also received a national endowment for the Humanities Challenge Grant for COHP, uh, COPH's Renovation and Expansion Initiative. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Natalie Fusekis, everyone. Thank you, Cecil. I'm so delighted to be here with all of you. Um, I'm particularly delighted uh, with the topic given that we just uh, passed in fall of 2020, the 100th anniversary of women getting the vote. And also because um, as Cecil pointed out, my work, um, especially for about the last decade has been focused on interviewing women in the region, activists and women in elected office or who are formerly in elected office who make a difference uh, through their civic engagement uh, through my women politics and activism project. And I am familiar with some of the women on the panel before I even joined because of that work and uh, because of the great work that they do. So I have the pleasure of not really talking a lot except to introduce our distinguished panelists and then um, serve as the moderator asking them questions. And then uh, at the end, when, we're, when they're done speaking, answering the questions that we've already prepared, we really hope that all of you will uh, type questions in the chat and engage with them so that uh, you can learn uh, more about the amazing work that they all do. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, three of which are alums of Cal State Fullerton and one who, as uh, President Virtue just pointed out, is uh, gonna be a Titan here uh, very, very soon. So first we have Michelle Martinez, who was appointed to the California, Trans appointed to the California Transportation Commissioner. And she also served on the Santa Ana City Council from 2006 to 2018. Martinez has been the founder and consultant and emergent P4 advisor since 2020. She has also served as a part-time adjunct professor at Santiago Canyon College since 2016. 
She volunteers as a special master at the U office of the US court judge, David O. Carter. Martinez was community and strategic planning development director at Prim Primester Development from 2019 to 2020. She served as executive director at One OC Alliance for a Healthy OC from 2010 to 2019. Um, and she was also Human Resources Director at Conquest America from 2006 to 2008. So I, we look forward to hearing what uh, Michelle has to say, uh, both as a former elected official and as someone who's been dedicated to her community for many years. Our second panelist is Lucy Dunn, alum also of Cal State Fullerton. She's President and CEO of the Orange County Business Council. As president and CEO of the Orange County Business Council, Dunn leads a dynamic organization of business members working with academia and the government to ensure the county's economic prosperity and high quality of life. Before joining OCBC, she served as director of the California Department of Housing and Community Development under Governor Schwarzenegger, who also appointed her to the California Transportation Commission in 2008. Governor Jerry Brown reappointed her to two more terms. She also has helped develop Orange County's 10-year plan to end homelessness and serves as a business advisor for the South Coast Air Quality Management District and Southern California Association of Governments. She's founding co-chair of the Real Coalition of 23 CEOs of California's largest business organizations from San Francisco to San Diego, advocating for infrastructure, education, water, and governance reform. Thanks for being with us, Lucy. Can't uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. The next uh, panelist is uh, Braytiel Agashi. Uh, she's also an alum of Cal State Fullerton. We, we see a theme here, CEO of Wise Place, um, formerly at WHW Forever Footprints, Big Brothers and Big Sisters, OC. Um, as chief executive officer for Wise Place, uh, Braytiel has led the organization since 2018. With more than 15 years in sales and management, she brings her business sense to the nonprofit community. In Braytiel's first year with Wise Place, she mainstreamed program operations and increased the number of Wise Place clients served by 100, she increased it by 182%, all while stabilizing and growing the financials by 53%. Wise Place also expanded to add a low barrier emergency shelter in addition to its existing transitional shelter. Boy, all nonprofits need the business sense like you've got. Um, under Britiel's leadership, Wise Place is now embarking on a development partnership to build 50 plus units of permanent supportive housing. Additionally, she expanded critical quality by bringing in trauma-informed care with a focus on mental health counseling and psychiatric support, in addition to other holistic needs such as alcohol and substance recovery and medical needs. Thank you for being with us, Britiel. Um, and finally, Tammy Tran, our newest Titan, is Senior Manager of Government Relations at Southern California Edison. She is also a former, she was a former chief, former deputy chief of staff and district director for a California state senator in central Orange County. As a senior manager for community engagement, local public affairs at Southern California Edison, which as we all know is one of the nation's largest electrical utilities providers, Tammy has um, served as a senior community liaison. She also currently serves as the president for Southern California Edison's Asian Pacific Islander Employee Resource Group called Asian Society for Cultural Exchange, Networking and Development, ASCEND. ASCEND was established in 2016 to promote workforce diversity, employee engagement and leadership development for API employees. Tammy has over 15 years of experience working in government, elections, media, and grassroots nonprofit organizations. Um, she has also served as a campaign manager, executive director for a nonprofit, which she helped start, policy advisor to a member of the Orange County Board of Supervisors and a field representative for a California State Assembly member. Tammy has also worked as a co-host for a weekly bilingual television program aimed at bringing government closer to the people. With all of this wonderful experience that you have, I think we're all gonna have a lot to learn from you about the power of the female vote and community engagement. So I would love to open the first question um, to our panelists. And again, 
no order of who can answer. Um, just pipe in when you would you like. The first question is, what issues do you think have the most impact among women in our society? Well, uh, it's, it's a great question. And, uh, and especially the tagline when, when you add uh, the question that you asked uh, added to it the the issue since 2011, 10 years ago, and uh, because the it's funny I was doing a little bit of research. Um, what I love about uh, President uh, Virgie's opening remarks is connecting Cal State Fullerton to both uh, uh, what we look like in Orange County and how Orange County is representing uh, the face of the United States, but I will dare say we're also a global hotspot in Orange County as we are at Cal State Fullerton. So such globally connected uh, faculty, students, issues that we deal with. And I say that because the World Economic Forum did a global gender gap report back in 2011. And the top issues at that time, if you recall, the demographics of the world were changing, we're experiencing a youth budge in, bulge in some countries, but in others, an aging population as we are in California, as we are in the United States. And women had multiple roles as workers, caregivers, mothers, and as the majority of the world's older persons, they were critical to making uh, a transition to that those new demographics successful. So we have to sort of think about family and fertility. And that was back in 2011. Also think about the fact that they were key civic leaders in 2011 in the uprising that launched the Arab Spring, right? Think about that 10 years ago, that their role back then needed to be recognized recognized um, with increasing gender equality in a political arena. So I'll close by saying the issues in 2011, think about them. Economic participation and opportunity for women, educational attainment for women, health and survival for women, and political empowerment, right? 10 years ago, those are the same issues we need to deal with today, right? And, and so I love this conversation and what we can add to it further, but those, those are still the top four issues, even in 2021. Hard shoes to, to fill going after Lucy Dunn, you know, someone who I respect <laughs> tremendously and filling her shoes as a, 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 in her or former role as the California Transportation Commission, certainly uh, have my hands uh, uh, full um, based <laughs> on all the work that Lucy has been able to do and, and I have always looked up to her and the great work that she's done in Orange County, but throughout California. So thank you, Lucy. Um, it's a great pleasure um, uh, to be on this panel. Uh, the way I look at things, and I'm a proud Titan, to, to move forward, we always have to look backwards. And I think it's imperative for us to understand that even in 2011, and Lucy said it very well, the same issues that that we faced in 2011 as women, we face today. But I think what's really important, and we've been hearing this with, with, with the racial justice issues of our time after George Floyd, is equity. And equity to me means access. And I think women um, in particular have not had the same access as, um, as, as men, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in the educational space, and more importantly, when it comes to the political space, um, I, one of uh, now of eight women who had the great pleasure of serving on the Santa Ana City Council for 12 years. So 150 years, you have only had eight women to serve on the Santa Ana City Council. That says a lot when you look at the representation and the breakdown of women in particular in Santa Ana, they vote more than, 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 than our counterparts as males and to understand that why only eight women, I think a lot of, uh, of that has to deal with access. 
uh, and more importantly about civic engagement. And you know, when we think about civic engagement, I think as women, we are more honed in on community, uh, on working alongside community. We volunteer, we participate. Um, you know, I, I'm not a mother, uh, but I had a mother. I know a lot of mothers out there. They participate in PTAs. They're very well vested in community, not more so the political process. And one of the things that um, I've come to realize, especially now the work that I'm doing with the houseless population, specifically here in the LA region, and you're starting to see the uptick of, of, of women who are houseless, you know, it, it has a lot to do with access and you know the, the amount of women that I'm seeing on the street, specifically on Skid Row is heartbreaking. And I think we need to also look at the opportunities um, in, in particular for, for that population of women and, and the barriers and the access that they have to educational attainment. Uh, but more importantly, the, the civic engagement role, um, I think uh, we need to talk a little bit more about that because it has a lot to do with culture. And um, sometimes uh, we tend um, not to um, have that discussion and I think they go hand in hand, culture and access. And so uh, with that, um, I, uh, I know there are a lot more uh, folks that would like to speak on this issue and so, I'm glad to participate. Thank you, Michelle. I'll, I'll follow Michelle. Um, you know, I I I I I appreciate how you brought up the, the eight women that are in position in decision making positions. And um, in preparation for today, um, I had I had another idea in terms of um, what the most in, you know the issues that are most impacting women. But the events of yesterday in Atlanta really just resonated with me all night and I couldn't sleep because I think about not only what has, um, you know, what has changed in the past decade uh, and what hasn't changed in the past decade and what hasn't changed in the last 40 years. Um, yesterday in Atlanta, there were eight people that were killed in a senseless act of violence. And I have to say it was an act of hate. Eight women, you know, who worked in working class women were killed. And in a lot of ways, um, I really identified with those women because um, I, I'm, I, without knowing their names today, not, without knowing their names or their faces today, I feel a lot of affinity to them because we're both, we're, we're all immigrants. Um, we're of Asian descent. Um, and, and I often think about like, you know, if my life had not taken a different path, if my mom, my mother had not left Vietnam as a refugee, and come to the United States and was, um, was sponsored by a church in Laguna Beach, my life could have, been, could have taken a different path. And so the question of what, what issue I think is most um, impacting women is equality and representation. And I think that there are some things that to this day, there's still a lot of inequality that exists for women and, and compounded by women of color, on top of that, women, women who are new immigrants to the country that don't speak the language of the country. These are all issues I feel like impact all women. And I know I speak from a place of privilege to be able to be on the screen with all of you. It's something that many people I know who look like me, who have similar histories and background that aren't able to share the same kind of forum. And so I think that's something that's important to talk about and to really um, reflect on is this inequity that exists even, you know, even within our immediate communities and our families. My mother you know, was someone that got to go to college um, when she was in Vietnam, but because of the war, she had to give up her education and then come to the United States and kind of restart her life again and give her up her life for myself. And I've been so lucky um, to have worked for a Titan, um, Lou Correa. And so I feel like I have a lot of connections to the, the Titan community. And my daughter, Annalise, who's seven years old, she's gonna have more opportunities than I did. Um, yet I feel like there's still these inequalities and lack of representation that still exist um, for women in general. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah, you know, I can just compliment what everyone has already, you know, so eloquently stated. I mean, for me, when I think of that question, for me, it's just, it's just the economy is not working for women. You know, that's mm -hmm. kind of the first thing that, you know, comes to my mind. And I think something like COVID really highlights um, kind of the breaks in policies that really affect women. And there's just shocking gender equality gaps. And that affects, you know, if, if women are still to this day making 80 cents on the dollar, 
um, and women of color making even less than that. That affects housing, that affects health care, that affects income. And so for me, just to quickly complement what um, the panelists have already um, stated, it's just that the economy is just not working for us. But there's things that we can do together to change it. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, um, Lucy, there was a question from the audience about for you to, to restate the top four goals for women that you had um, given us at the beginning. Sure, happy to do that. Um, they, they, these are the, 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 the overarching four metrics that global leaders look at for countries as they try to elevate women uh, with uh, the, the gender gap. And they are one, economic participation and opportunity, two, educational attainment, three, health and survival, and four is political empowerment. Interestingly enough, both in 2011 and in 2020, the top country in the world was Iceland that both that best uh, had opportunities for women in equal. The United States, to their credit, bumped up. Um, uh, uh, in 2011, I think they were, prior to that, they were like 39th ranked, and then they bumped up to like 19 or something. So they're, they're, they are getting better compared to other countries. But it is an interesting study when you look at those four performance metrics which what countries are doing it um, better than others. So yeah, and, and you can find all of this online. Um, so it's a it's a very, very interesting analysis. Thank you, Lucy. And I think all the other panelists talked talked on and touched on different aspects of that um, exactly. right here at, at home. So I'd like to move to our to the next question. Um, so based on your personal and professional experiences, how have you all linked civic engagement to the advocacy work that you do? I'll go. Um, I, I think it's important. Um, I think the civic engagement and advocacy work are one and the same. Um, I was very lucky at a young age to be involved with politics. In a lot of ways, it was by accident. Um, straight out of college, I got an opportunity um, to connect with a friend who was working for then assembly member Luke Correa, again, a Titan, a very proud Titan. Um, I applied to work in his office and rather than go and continue with graduate school, I ended up working for him for one year and one year turned into 12 years. Um, and I feel like one of the things I, I believe it's important about linking civic engagement to advocacy work is, is, is taking those opportunities when they come, when they come up you know, really caring about an issue. And I think today it's so easy to get involved with civic participation or to get civically engaged, whether it's through the formal pol political um, infrastructure or, it, or, or just voting. And so I think as students, um, especially at a campus like Cal State Fullerton, there's so many different opportunities and there's a huge alumni network where you can tap into, where there's a plenty of internship opportunities, opportunities to work on a project or an issue that you care about. And so I feel like um, it's really just making sure that you own your voice. And then one thing that I've always learned is one is too small a number for greatness. And so always remembering that you're not alone, that you could be part of something greater. Um, at a very young age, I was very, always very um, interested in things that were happening in Vietnam. And I learned um, in high school about modern day slavery and how women are women and children are still part of the slave labor. When I worked for Luke Correa at the time, I was able to kind of link that to my work, working on human trafficking issues. Um, there's an Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, and I share that because there's so many things that we can care, we care about, and there are so many ways for us to really have a voice on that and to be, be an advocate. So definitely, um, in summary, you know, use your voice, join with others, and it's so easy nowadays with social media and so many different opportunities that are available to be involved as students. Uh, great. I, I, I'll go next, Michelle Martinez. Um, I always tell folks, if you're not at the table, you will be on the menu. And when I look at civic engagement and advocacy, it is imperative as women to be 
at the table and not on the menu, but more importantly, so before, even if we're at the table, we should also, you know, and I'll use the analogy of food, that we should also be making sure that we get to choose the ingredients. Uh, typically through policy making, a lot of times in my personal experience, what I've observed is that uh, there's a lot of, of, of specifically women who get to the table, but don't get to choose the ingredients. And, 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 and community period. And that's what I've observed in, in my uh, 15 um, plus years in, the, in public spaces. But one thing that I also want to talk about is that we need to step into our power, but it doesn't always have to be, you know, um, you know, a position of leadership that is political. You can have a take a leadership role that's informal and still make a tremendous impact. And what I've seen through many women organizations that I've been a part of, um, you know, I always ask women to run for office. I think I said, uh, it's important for you to be at the table. Your voice is important. But I, I've also have uh, realized that it's also important for women to have these informal leadership positions to be behind the scenes to help other women who so choose to want to be in the public eye and want to run for office. I, I will say that as someone that served for 12 years, uh, I really enjoy being on the other side now, <laughs> not being in the public eye, being in an informal uh, role, being able to to, to really speak my mind per se, uh, where when I was elected, you know, there, 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 there are times where, you know, you had to have a tight lip, you know, because you're addressing um, issues that are sensitive. Um, and sometimes, you know, our opinions, um, you know, can't matter when you're addressing public policy, you have to look at the whole and not parts of the system. And so I've recognized that over time. And so what I would say today, whether you're a student, and you choose to take an informal leadership role or a formal leadership role in the public um, in, in public policy is to step into your power and to also recognize that it's not only important to be at the table, but to also ensure that if you have an issue, discuss that because there's never a wrong answer. One of the things that I always tell young women that I mentor that we're going to make mistakes. And, and guess what? It's okay. We are not perfect. It's okay to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. They make us better people. And so um, the last thing that I would just share with, uh, with you all that I think it's important is that, you know, we look at democracy um, in general, uh, you know, I really believe democracy lies within its people. And I think as women, we have realized that it lies within people, but it lies within our communities. The power doesn't lie per se uh, within a political government institution. It lies within its people and its community. And I think it's important for us um, that we can't do this by ourselves, that it's going to take a community, it's going to take a village to help raise not just women issues, but all issues that we face in our community. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle is, is and she's so um, modest because this woman started um, as just a Santa Ana resident who was very young and at a very young age engaged in her community and things bugged her and she ran for city council. Who knew? She was so brave. And now not only uh, a leader uh, at Santa Ana uh, on the city council, but also then at the Southern California Association of Governments where she ran the entire elected officials on good transportation and housing planning for all of Southern California and now a statewide role. So it's blossoms from very young and it's just a passion you have. And I can't, I couldn't agree with both of my colleagues more in that um, civic engagement is advocacy, but it, you never think about that, right? Because even in the four paths of my life, when I started out practicing law, I did a lot of work with conservatorships, caring for the elderly. And it became one of those things in my work where I recognized I needed to do something more to help them. And you become an advocate just from your work. You don't even realize it's civic engagement. I moved on to doing real estate and land entitlement. My passion became for the company I work for, they were a home builder, but my passion was wetlands restoration. 
and protecting the environment and learning about how to do the best plan to protect endangered species. Who would have thought about that from a real estate developer? But that was my passion and I learned and I became engaged in our community, benefited the company, but also benefited the environment. You move on, state housing director, right? Now I'm learning all of this stuff about homelessness. I was in the market side of home building, the market rate side. Now I'm learning about mobile home parks and homeless shelters and farm worker housing. And you become engaged and uh, an advocate in the civic side. And now last but like at OCBC, you can't distinguish civic engagement from advocacy because you, your passions become those things that you fight for. And it's all about at the end of the day, the things that, that we women in particular find very moving it's about helping other people and making life better for other people. And we all may dis disagree on what that path might be to doing that, but the goal to help people's lives and to do something better for your community and make your community more livable, it, it moves us all. And so um, continue to help uh, in, those, in those, those, those realms, but uh, helping people recognize their passion and recognizing that they do, they can do it. And, and you don't start by being on the transportation commission like Michelle and I, you start with those small little things that move you and suddenly they blossom and grow and you realize you have a voice and you have more power than you think and you can make a difference. That's so true. And I think, you know, we do advocacy in everyday actions that we take. Um, I personally found my voice at Cal State Fullerton. So I think as students, you know, participating in this, I think it's a, it's a great place to start. Um, I am a, an immigrant from the Middle East. I came here when I was about seven years old. And so my culture isn't traditionally very involved. And as I was working two jobs and putting myself through uh, school at Cal State Fullerton, um, you know, there was elections going on. And that was kind of my first kind of, um, you know, put your toe in the, put your toe in the water, right? But I mean, Cannonball too, I mean, I've learned as I've grown in my career, um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like the other panelists said, don't worry about being perfect. Don't worry about knowing everything. That's not what advocacy is about, right? It's just taking your passion and not just having good intention, but having action behind that. Um, every time you volunteer, that's advocacy. Every time you stand up for something that you're passionate about, that's advocacy. So you may not even realize it that you're 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 doing advocacy. You know, advocacy isn't voting for a president every four years, right? And I know personally, I really found my voice. I joined clubs on campus. I started to volunteer, and for me, I turned that into a career. Um, you know, I I was when I was in college, I was doing you know sales and business development, and I was able to turn my advocacy and my passion into a career by joining the nonprofit industry. Um, and it's, it's a tough industry, um, you know, but it's, it's a great place to, um, you know, start to volunteer, start to intern, start to just reach out to people regardless of industry and ask them, um, you know, how did you, how did you get to where you were? And I guarantee they're, they're passionate about something and they're choosing to um, go to work every day and be passionate about something, whether it's a volunteer or corporate. But there's so many great opportunities at Cal State Fullerton. And for me, um, you know, 15 years later, they're still my best friends that I met at the Feminist Club um, at different clubs on campus at Fullerton. So it's a great time to be involved. Thank you. Um, our next question deals with the the two main political parties in this country. Um, what do you wish both the Republican and Democratic parties knew about women and their civic engagement? Uh, 
And I'll go, this is Michelle. We have common sense <laughs> and we want to bring people together. Uh, you know, I, you know, for my last two years in office, and I want to share this story, I served with six other men. I was the only woman on the Santa Ana City Council, and, the, and, and I left as the mayor pro tem, and so, you know, which is funny and interesting, and I love my, I love my former colleagues, like they were my brothers. We grew up together. I was 26 when I got elected. And I left at 38. And so, you know, we, I kind of grew up with them. And so they were like my, my older brothers. And what was interesting is that, you know, when the position came up for Mayor Pro Tem, um, after um, Mayor Pro Tem Claudia Alvarez left after six years, she had that role as Mayor Pro Tem. And then it was uh, me and, and the boys. And they were all, you know, figuring out who was going to be the next Pro Tem. And, you know, and I'm the only woman on the council and they all make a decision who's going to be next and they move on and it's, you know, Sal Tina Harrell and then Vince Sarmiento and then Dave and then the last is, is, is myself and council member David Benavides and they're thinking David next at, at some point someone comes to me actually our former mayor comes to me and says, don't you think it's your turn to be mayor pro tem I'll, I'll support you and I'm like well what do you want Miguel. Uh, that was my response. And not once did I think about serving in that role because it's no different. It's just a title. And I think it's important to realize that these titles actually can make a difference um, and, and really move the needle forward. Um, and I sat predominantly with a, a city council that was democratic, but I worked alongside many Republicans at SCAG or through the toll road and the different regional boards that I sat on. And what I would say is that, you know, I think it's important for, um, you know, uh, for, for these, uh, I, and I guess how, do, how, how could I put it in these terms is that whether you're Republican or Democrat, I think it's irrelevant. I think it's the work that women want to do. They want to help. We want, you know, as a council member, I want, I was the glue. I wanted to bring my colleagues together to set an agenda to move my city forward. It wasn't a Republican issue, wasn't a Democrat issue, wasn't a male issue versus a woman issue. I just rose up to the occasion and said, hey, this, these are the things that we need to get done. So my comment's gonna be simple and I'm, I'm gonna borrow the words of um, Ruth Bader <laughs> Ginsburg. Women belong in places where decisions are made. I think it's that simple. Whether you're a Republican party, the Democratic party or the corporate world or any other places where decisions are made, things are just better if women are making the decisions or they're included in the decision-making process. So I, I, I just feel like um, I've been very lucky to be in spaces where I'm not the official decision maker, but I get to be part of the decision making process. And I think that's so key to civic engagement. And I think the other thing about the Republican or the Democratic Party is that, you know, the, the, reaching out to women or getting women involved, it's more than just politics, right? It, it's, it's something that, that needs to be a, a critical part of all of our activities in society. Um, and, and the other thing I would say with, with civic engagement, um, we have to change the way for, um, make it easier for women to be involved. I'm a working mom of two. It's very difficult for me um, sometimes to be, in, to be involved and even more so as because my kids are so young, but I've been very lucky to work for a company at Southern California Edison or to have a former boss, Lou Correa, who's very um, inclusive. And I, many of you have seen, I bring my kids with me. I take them to the voting polls. I take them along with me to speaking engagements or to events. And I think that we have to normalize that in order for more women to be civically engaged. Um, and at the end of the day, more women in decision-making in decision making positions. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll jump in on this one too. I, I would like Republicans and Democrats to recognize that there's a huge swath of us out there that they don't appeal to. And they are tacking too far left. They are tacking too far right. They are not dealing with the issues that are the bread and butter issues that women have to deal with every single day. We have to balance our own home budgets. We have to educate our children from freaking Zoom boxes. And they're all talking politics and we're fed up. And so, uh, and that, that, uh, that dynamic 
because those women will vote and they are, they showed that they voted uh, very strongly, surprisingly so, because there were a lot of votes that went ways you didn't think they were gonna go because women are dealing with real life issues every single day. And I would like uh, those parties to start thinking a much bigger tent instead of a smaller tent because they're already good women. You're, you're, Tammy's right and Michelle is right. There's already great women in leadership in both parties to a great degree. Women have engaged more. There are more women in Congress now than there have ever been in history. And there are in fact more women graduating from university than men for, for several years that has been the case. So we've got education uh, there. But the politics of, um, that, that has been going on the last few years uh, has, it is not something that most women find attractive or inviting. Uh, they much prefer to build consensus and get stuff done. And so um, that's my, my fair warning to both parties. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. That's a good warning. <laughs> Hopefully they're listening, Lucy. Um, yeah, I agree. I just, I don't care what party you belong to. I don't even love the fact that I don't think women care that there's a traditional two party system. That's not what it's about for us. Um, we want justice and we want accountability. And I think more and more, uh, regardless of what you know party you ascribe to, that's what you want. You want justice for your community and you want accountability. Um, and just, you know, I think um, women are going to be holding politicians uh, more accountable. And I think that's a really, really great thing. And I think both parties should be <laughs> terrified of that <laughs> and terrified into action, I hope. Um, action that makes a just and equitable society for women. Um, and I think that's what women care about. Thank you. That was really wonderful responses. Um, so kind of conversely to that question, what do you wish women knew about civic engagement beyond presidential elections, major elections, political, you know, elected office? Um, I think you all have touched on this already, but um, what else can women know about civic engagement that's beyond sort of the obvious? I, I'd like to begin by saying, if you haven't read uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, it's a good one to start for, for women of all kinds, uh, whether you're a, a stay-at-home mom or you know the highest level in, in government. One of the hardest things for women is they, that, that resonated me so well is um, a woman uh, won't apply for a job, be it employed or volunteer, unless she thinks she's 100% qualified. And men will apply for a job or volunteer even when they're not. <laughs> God love them because they know they're going to get on the job training. They're smart. They, they know how to do this. And they have a network of, of men that will allow them to, you know, succeed. And women haven't always learned effectively how to develop their own echo chambers and their own support system with other women. That that rule of thumb applies for civic engagement because women, you can engage at any level and volunteer at any level from your child's um, parent teacher association, your PTA boards to uh, seeking an appointment on a parks commission in your city council to literally there are thousands of openings um, at uh, within the governor's administration that are not paid staff positions, they're volunteer positions and you can go online and check them out and submit an application. And they're looking more for women. In fact, Jerry Brown, to his credit, he stated to me that he wanted every board and commission before he left office to have 50% women, God love him. Uh, I, heard, I haven't heard the same thing from uh, the Newsom administration, but from the highest levels in this state to um, even just your local city council, do, do you like your little, little local you know, community um, 4th of July parade? Volunteer to be on the parade board. You don't, have to, you don't have to lead it, just volunteer. And that kind of engagement builds your confidence 
and gets you going. If you're ready to go for a governor's appointment, by Lord, just fill one out now. I don't care what age you are. Practice applying and practice um, uh, going for it. You're going to get something. And that's the, a nice, great start for civic engagement. Find your passion. Um, you can do it. And uh, that start will build successes for even greater things. Eventually, here's my sneaky, this is my sneaky thing. If I can get you to apply as a volunteer for a board or a commission, I'm setting you up to run for public office someday, right? I'm making you brave because now you're dealing with the public and you're able to speak and you're able to get involved. And so there is a there is like a, like an ulterior motive for me because I think smart women that are fearful and um, you know afraid to engage, I can get you out there, and then eventually you're going to be brave enough that you'll actually be in a position of great power over money and over policy. And then we make the world better. So I, I would um, start off with hyper-local. I'm a big believer and I um, definitely agree with everything that Lucy said. And hyper-local is exactly what she's saying, starting at our PTA, starting in your own, um, in your own neighborhood. Um, I think you know, taking a true hyper-local approach and more so in an informal approach, getting started there um, is imperative. Uh, there's so much work to be done at the hyper-local level, and that is at the neighborhood level. The most impact we can make, whether it's government institutions, NGOs, private sector, um, you know, go government period, is at the neighborhood level. That's where it all starts at. And there is no better place than to begin at the hyper-local level, which is the neighborhood level. I would then also just say that it's important for us to recognize that if we choose to, to volunteer, um, you know, don't look at that as, well, you know, it may not get me anywhere because Lucy is so right. Those of us that ask women to volunteer, we always have a motive. It's either because we want you to run for public office or we want you to be part of this bigger board or we want you to apply for a statewide commission to prepare you. Um, you know, and 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 it's a, and and that's a starting point. And one thing, you know, I'll say this is that when I left office, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. I wanted to continue to serve. I have a, a heart of service and. I wanted to continue to give back. I just didn't want to do it in the in the political world. And so I decided to volunteer my time as a special master to federal court judge David O. Carter. People are saying, you don't get paid for that? You're doing all that work for free? And I and I and I would just, my friends would tell me, like, shouldn't you get paid? You spend a lot of time doing that. And I was getting paid and I have been getting paid. The reward is seeing that I can make a difference in the lives of women who are out there in the street and being able to get them a home, to learn, to meet new people, to navigate a system that I was unaware of, that now I have the tools and the wisdom to help elected officials, a federal court judge, nonprofit organizations on what should and how things can be done in a productive way. We led the way in Orange County and now trying to lead the way in Los Angeles, but it takes a village. It takes, it takes a lot of us. And what I would encourage is that we as women sh should not only have a groups of friends or pods that we call them now of women who we associate with, but also build relationships with women you may not think you have interest with or you may not agree with 100% of the time. I do my best not to just hang out with like-minded people. I love to learn. I want to know, you know, why they think a certain way so that I can listen and understand. I think it's so important for us to listen today and to understand the perspectives of, of, of various groups and specifically in, our, in the women's spaces. There is a lot of hostility in our society today. There is also, um, you know, a lot of, of, of burnout. I, and, and specifically during this pandemic, women who've had to work at home, take care of their children, having to cook, do several things. 
and there is a burnout effect and we need support. And so I would just encourage us all, no matter if you're volunteering or you, 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 you are an executive director for a great organization or you're a politician or a student, um, you know, doing multiple things that you need a support structure, you need mentors and you need advisors to help you along the way. And I would just add to your kind of original question was about leveraging civic engagement. It's just the power of organizing. And that could be, you know, with uh, large organizations, but even the power to organize kind of in your own circle when you're passionate about something. Don't hold that, you know, um, kind of close to the chest. Talk to your family. Um, talk to your parents. Talk to your aunts. Talk to your uncles. Talk to your friends. Talk to your neighbors. Um, and, you know, there's a way to kind of engage in that because I just, you know, we, we've seen it. We've seen it recently and hopefully we'll continue to see it when somebody uses their voice to organize. So imagine if I was really passionate about something that's really, really great. And that's where everything starts. But if I was to kind of combine forces with Tammy, right, or somebody else, it's kind of that that compound. So that's the only thing I would add to your kind of how do you leverage support for women is just to make sure, don't forget the power of organizing. I think we've seen it recently and it's just so critical. I absolutely agree with that. I think it's so important that we remember that we're not alone. Like I really truly believe that one is too small a number for greatness. And so I, if I think back of, of all the things that I've been able to be involved with, it, it involved other people, it involved other women. It also involved men who are allies, right? And so that's important too, is to recognize the men in our lives or in our communities that, that make way and, and, and create space for women to participate. I mean, I got to work for a Latino legislator and then there's so many ways that he just, he, um, he affirmed and, and helped me grow as a professional. You know, I'm the kind of person, I'm an introvert. I, I don't naturally love to be out front and center, but you know, but he would often put me in those positions. And so I think that's important is to leverage those opportunities where you have someone that backs you up. You have a community that supports you. Um, and I will make a commitment to all the students that are on this, um, you know, on this Zoom event. If you're willing to reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, Tammy Tran on LinkedIn and and I will take you out to lunch um, after this pandemic and, and commit to supporting you as a student. Because I was a student, someone gave me an internship. Somebody took a chance on me, invited me to be a part of an organization or invited me to an event. Michelle has done that for me. Lucy has done that for me. Many folks at Cal State Fullerton has done that for me. And so I commit to you guys for taking your time during this lunch hour to listen to us reach out to me on LinkedIn. I promise I'll take you to lunch and whatever I can do to help you. If you want to come work for Southern California Edison, we're always hiring. So join us. Um, that's how we leverage civic engagement is by supporting each other and bringing people along with us. Thank you. Okay, we're um, the last question of the, of the day before we open it up to um, all of you is um wait i just lost my question sheet um oh here we go from your personal and professional experiences what advice would you give to individuals who want to leverage civic engagement to support women Okay, you guys, this is a, I think this is sort of a hard question because we kind of touched on a lot of these factors when we were uh, chatting before. Um, the, the one thing that I would just is, you know, women, we, we have a lot of priorities in our life. There's, you got to manage home and family and work because we're all working with managing children as well. And so I, I would just when you add civic engagement to this one more thing, following your plat passion, right? Follow your bliss, things that you love. Um, the, the one thing is to support you. Just remember, I, 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 you know, you can, you can't always do everything at one time. And so I, I am old now. These women on this zoom are young and I, my old person's advice <laughs> is to really choose your children. 
make sure your children are, your, are, are a priority because they're not gonna be with you for very long. And, if, and, and I love the quote from Jacqueline Kennedy. If you bungle raising your children, it doesn't matter what else you do. So just from, and I'm sharing this with you with a little bit of guilt because there were many times in my career where it seemed that I chose my career over my children. They turned out okay, thank God. But when I look back and I go, gosh, I wish I had spent more time. Don't be that person. Spend the time and recognize that our society is going to cost you, that you will pay a price for that because it's not fair. It, it does result in a lower pay scale. You got to catch up. There's not equity in pay when you take time off for your kids. But I will share with you now, and it didn't happen in my generation, and it is happening in yours. Men are taking time off for their kids now. And so therefore that pay equity, that pay gap, isn't gonna be there long. Because when they recognize how important their children are in their lives, and you've been doing it all along, my advice to you is, you can do this, take the time off from your kids and don't be afraid that you won't be treated as an equal. Men are doing it, you can do it. So engage in civic engagement, do, your, do good work, finish your education and those with children, that's our future, right? I mean, that's why we have you in school. You are our future. And, um, and I would just, that would be my, my best advice from the older generation. <laughs> Couldn't agree more with Lucy and she's definitely not old, uh, Lucy. I, um, <laughs> I would say that today, um, you know, and, 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 I, you know, we have students here that are fairly young and, you know, they probably would think I'm old too. I'm going on 42 years of age uh, this August. And, you know, what I would say is this, the way I look at civic engagement is you being an active citizen. And, and I have, a, you know, and the question that I pose as an adjunct professor, when I teach, I ask my students, who do you choose to be for this time? For this time, not what five years ago, 10 years ago, or what's ahead of us. Now, be fully present. And who do you choose to be for this time? And focus on the work that is in front of you. So if it's your children, focus on your children. If it's your family, focus on your family. If it's your church, focus on your church. If it's you being an active citizen and wanting to organize from the bottom up, do that, but don't create more work. I think a lot of us want to save the world and we have all these great ideas, but there's so much work in front of us that sometimes we tend to miss it because we are thinking globally and it's okay to think globally, but you must act locally. And I go back to that hyper local perspective. And so I leave you all with this, who do you choose to be for this time? And to, and, and to have an open heart, to be an active citizen is truly civic engagement and, and ensure that whatever you do to focus on you, self-love, self-care and focusing on family does matter. In my 12 years of office, I will too, I will say as well, I didn't have children. I was fairly young. I missed out on a lot of opportunities because I was so dedicated to the job, wanting to be the best policy maker Santa Ana had. But at the same time, I realized that I was missing so much in the, in the real world. And, and there, I could have had so much more, could have done so much more as a human being. And so what I would say to you all, don't think that you can't focus on your family and also be an active citizen because you can do both. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Should I open? Oh, go ahead, Tammy. I'll just add that I'm, I'm an example that you can do both. Um, you know, I, I join, um, I left um, politics and, and, and now currently work for Southern California Edison. And the first year I was at Edison, I became pregnant. It wasn't planned, I did. And I freaked out initially, but ultimately it worked out. I have had two kids since I've been at Edison 
I've gotten promoted twice and and I feel like you can do it all because you have the support of other women. Um, the workplace has changed. Um, you know, I have um, mentors at, at, at the, um, you know, at Edison that, you know, who are probably 10, 15 years ahead of, uh, ahead of me, who said it was very difficult for them to even talk about having kids or being a working mom. That's not the case anymore. Like nowadays, corporate America, the business sector and everything, being, a, being able to support your working mom, your working parent, Lucy, is, is something that employees are asking for. Top talent is asking for that. And so I would just end by saying that the advice I would give you is make sure you know what you want in life. You know, make sure you figure out what, how you walk in your purpose, because, you know, I, I didn't set out to work for Edison, but I feel like what keeps me um, at the company, is not only our broad goals on clean energy future, but it's also because they allow me to live the life I want. I can be a mom. I'm here at home with my kids, you know, on Zoom, which I don't want them on Zoom, but it is what it is. But I feel like I can be involved with PTA. I can be involved in my community. I can join a candlelit vigil tonight for those women in, in Atlanta. And so I think that's something that we have to demand of our employer. We have to demand of our society that they have to make it work for us because we, the future is female. Tammy is spot on. And that is something that is so important that companies are looking to hire is if you have gotten a great Cal State Fullerton education, you are a smart Titan and you're gonna be romanced by companies, you're gonna be looking for companies that will enable you to have it all to the extent that that's the opportunity for you, right? There, uh, and so good, good talent, talented, um, employees and prospective employees, you look for those companies that give you the opportunities that Edison does. And, uh, and, and if you don't find it at the first job, you'll find it at the second job. So that's very wise advice that Tammy and Michelle have both given you. Yeah. And that's just, you know, reinstates that representation really matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear from this. So um, whether you're a woman who chooses not to have children, we every single person has a family, right? And your family is who, who you choose, whether you have children or not. And it, it's relative to everybody. And it's just a, a huge reminder to me that representation matters. So as women um, with or without children, regardless of age, regard, like we need to be at the table um, to make the economy work for us, to make healthcare work for us, to make childcare work for us, to make income, um, housing, all of it. Um, so representation matters and it's just a, a huge reminder. Uh, thank you all so much. And one of the things I was thinking about amongst all the themes, but you all are clearly have been mentored and have been mentors um, to people. And I think that's really, really, really important. Um, and it's also whether we have kids or not. If you have kids, you're mentoring your kids, right? So one of the things you do is you take your kids with you, right? They need to see this stuff. But also as a professor, I try to involve my students in the work that I do so that you know, if they wanna go that path, they've at least had some experience or introduce them to the people that can give them the experience that they want. So I really, I thank you all for, for being such good mentors. Um, so we have some general questions uh, from those who are, have been listening to this wonderful conversation. And um, so the first one is, how can others be better allies to women and support the female voice? One of the things that I really have uh, had fun teaching women is to be good echo chambers for each other. Um, men have learned this uh, in the business world very, very effectively over generations. And we women now need to help each other when you're sitting in a, a meeting or you're doing a group discussion. Um, it's, it's very effective for you to say, uh, well, you know, Tammy just said an important point. I'd like to reinforce that because what she, in other words, be the echo so that, because we women don't tend to like to brag. Did you notice how long it took each of us to just like say, who was going to unmute their mic to answer a question? We were all just politely sitting back waiting for each other. That's a typical woman thing. Men on this panel, they would have jumped in and go, oh, me first, me first, me first. But we women are, are we tend to be a little more like, oh, well, what's the protocol, right? So in this world, 
start to help each other by being an echo chamber for another woman, uh, an echo and her and and amplify her voice to give her power and support while you're also adding to her conversation. So that's just one little hint that I would do um, uh, uh, to, to help women. And then the other thing is the second point is, that I reinforced said earlier is women, you don't have to be 100% qualified to go after that job. Raise your hand, raise your hand, apply, don't worry, just do it. You know, that's, that's the best way to get your place in the world and, and start out. Okay, um, this, the next question, um, it, it was like, starts with a comment and then has a question. So it says, thank you ladies for participating and sharing your expertise with us today. Given the polarization in our society today, what can we as women do to bring us back together for the betterment of our shared community? Um, I would say in just, it's one word, listen. We, we, we have to listen. I, I think um, it's imperative uh, for us today um, to not just listen, but work alongside. You know, I, I, when I go into a community, I don't act like I'm the expert. I'm a helper. I'm a connector. Um, you know, going into a community saying, that, you know, I'm the practitioner. I'm the expert. I'm the one that's going to tell you what's right. Um, sometimes going into the spaces and specifically other spaces, we talked about mentorship earlier. Um, when, when I mentor um, other women elected officials throughout this country, you know, what I share with them is that what's your lived experience? Let me help understand who you are. And then let me listen to that before I try to give any kind of advice, um, you know, because my lived experience is very different than their lived experience, specifically with someone that I mentor in Boise, Idaho, Santa Ana, California, Boise, Idaho, two different um, uh, parts of, of, of the state and, and different issues. And so I, I, again, I would just say um, the, the most important thing is for us to listen uh, specifically in this polarized uh, society that we are uh, facing and it's very daunting. Okay, um, next question is what for, and I think maybe each of you can answer this one. What is something surprising that each of you learned in your past civic engagement leadership experiences? I'll go, it's, it's not that hard. It's not har that hard to get civically engaged. Um, you start having a conversation with someone and it leads to all sorts of opportunities to have your voice heard. My, my big aha moment was, you wouldn't know that now, but I, I was painfully shy. And I still think of myself as sort of an introvert extrovert. I mean, mm -hmm. I can do these Zoom things and I public speak all the time, but my little aha moment is my company had asked me to do a press conference on this major project, highly contentious project in the press every single day. And I was supposed to do the press conference. And they, the reason was, is they said, because a woman on this issue has more credibility than a man. And that's why we want you talking to the press. Mm -hmm. And I was petrified. I'd never done that before. Never spoken to the press, never had to take questions. So I had to do a presentation and this, and they said, no, you're, you're going to do this. And I think I must have been all of, I don't know, I mean, it sounds old now, but maybe I was 38 or 37 or something and handling my first press conference. And as I was standing up there scared to death with 20 reporters in front of me and I'm putting on my, my presentation and then I, it, the aha moment came, the surprise came for me when all these reporters started asking me questions about this project and I was able to answer the questions and I articulated in a way that made them understood. I understood my audience because I couldn't speak in jargon speak. I had to speak in a way that a reporter could write an answer or to put stuff in nouns and verbs together that made sense to a general reader audience. And I had a moment as they were asking me questions where I thought to myself, I suddenly stood up taller and I went, wow, I actually can do this. I, I can do this. 
I, I know my product. I know my, 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 you know, um, project, uh, and I'm able to answer. And it was, it was one of those moments where you suddenly became more powerful and more confident just by doing someone threw me in the pool and I learned to swim right there. And I made it to the goal line. And afterwards the stories got written and the, the press conference was a success, but it wasn't the, the surprise for me was actually petrified and then just doing it. Um, so as a result, I, I do a lot of press conferences. <laughs> So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting when you, but you kind of learn your gifts, right? Who knew that that was a gift that I could do and, and that you could do public speaking. I didn't know until someone, a man pushed me in front of a microphone and said, we think you can do this. And, uh, and that was kind of fun. That was kind of a nice, nice revelation. Do either of the last two of you want to share a surprise? Um, we have a couple more minutes. I would say for, for me, um, one of the surprises is that small bets, small things, you know, a lot of us think big is sexy, you know, that's what makes the, the headlines, but it's those small little projects or those small little efforts within civic engagement or advocacy that could have ripple effects. And, and I've seen that time and time in my work um, of addressing homelessness. And, you know, I'll tell you that in all my years of service and dealing with public service, there was no more gratitude and grace and, and just um, this, this love for helping those people that are focusing on wanting to help at the neighborhood level and are making drastic changes. The world may not know about it, their city council may not know about it, but they're changing lives block by block. And sometimes it's those small bets that have ripple effects. Yeah, just start where you are, just start. I think every single person has kind of come back to that. Just start, don't hold back, don't be afraid. Don't worry about like so-called failure. It's all just learning. <laughs> um, and if you're not, you know, we all learn along the way and it's okay to change your mind. That's actually, um, you know, a very good thing and it shows mm -hmm. growth and, and resilience. So just start, that's it, just start. <laughs> well, I, I wanna say a personal um, thank you all for sharing so much um, wisdom an insight with everyone today. And as a historian of women, as somebody who you know has studied grassroots activism and civic engagement for most of my career, I, I am appreciative of the work that you are all doing today. And you're standing on the shoulders of women who've been doing it in this nation for a very long time. Um, and I think sometimes people forget that, right? They, they mm -hmm. forget how long women have been working maybe not in the front of the house, but behind the scenes, uh, you know, and from places that people have missed as, you know, as, as you were all talking about in your neighborhood that doesn't get seen, right? That's where, uh, you know, for a very long time, women were making a big difference, but nobody saw it. Um, and now people are paying attention because we have, uh, you know, more women than ever in Congress, more women of color than ever in Congress. Um, but, but women have been doing this work and I, I think, more of us need to keep doing it. And I think, I think we've got all the questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much um, to our panelists, for our moderator and our partners in alumni engagement and government external relations for, for our talk today. I personally felt super empowered. Let me tell you, I went up and looked up like ways to get involved in like boards and city councils in my local city. So thank you so much for empowering and, and sharing your stories and, and, and giving us the opportunity to kind of remember, it doesn't matter where you start, but you have to start somewhere, right? So thank you so much for, for that um, today. Um, I wanna remind everybody that this conversation will be posted on our DIEP YouTube channel with closed uh, captioning for folks who um, didn't catch the whole thing or wish to share this with somebody else who couldn't make it today. 
Um, I also want to thank all our attendees for coming. Um, please keep a lookout for our next Titan Table Talk. It will be on October 14th. Um, and I hope folks enjoy the rest of Social Justice Week. Um, we have a ton more events that are happening. Um, we have a keynote speaker Friday. Um, w. Kamal Bell will be here to speak to our campus about social justice. We have a lot of different other programs. Titan Night Market will be happening tomorrow night. So um, if you can, please come and enjoy more programs and events and workshops. And once again, thank you so much for our panelists. Thank you so much for our moderator today to, to kind of remind us, right, of the power of the female voice. So thank you so much to everybody. Goodbye and take care, everyone. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Cecil. Thank you, Cecil. Thank, thank you, President you Graham. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Go Titans. You guys were incredible. You were Go incredible. Titans. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, really, Graham. really amazing. Thank you, all of you. You guys were uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm so proud to be led by you. It's just that you were really, really inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Take care.